Hello, uh, my name is Nagarjun. So uh, I'm going to, uh, it's a good opportunity for me to actually talk at this Bioprocess Virtual Event 2020. And the title of the, today's talk is going to be Droplet Distal PCR as a tool for gene therapy application. So I just want to highlight one thing on this title slide is the image I put it in the title slide. So it's just the complexity of how biologics have come up from a small molecule uh, to a viral particle as well as a cell. So you can look at the size of these molecules and how complexity has been increased in this biological world and the new technology that's really required to really answer this complex molecule. So as a confidentiality statement today, uh, most of this presentation is for educational purpose. So any uh, statements that are made like forward looking statements or it's mostly from published literature and uh, not taken into assurance that like this can be becoming like a next, uh, like a uh, taking into consideration like these are from literature and don't really, uh, if these actual results doesn't really uh, move forward as expected, there may be other factors in it. So the overview of the talk today is like, I'm going to introduce you to gene therapy vectors, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the drug life cycle. And I'm also going to talk about how analytical method development has been involved into this drug development. And I will introduce you to the droplet distal PCR, and I'll talk about like how the method development really happens and how do you really quantify uh, different data on a digital doctor PCR. And I will go ahead and talk about the qualification and validation parameters specifically for digital doctor PCR in application to gene therapy vector. And I'll give my final thoughts and some literature. So talking about gene therapy vector. So this pie chart has been, I designed this pie chart, and this data is from the website that's been put up by the gene medicine. So this actually sh shows you a landscape of different viral vectors or vectors that are really involved in gene therapy clinical trials. And this data is around like four years back, and this landscape changed a lot. And primarily looking at the whole pie chart, the first things you can really observe is like adenovirus virus. Uh, retroviruses have been playing a critical role uh, in this gene therapy trials. As said, there are a bunch of other vectors in viral that are also playing a role, viral antiviruses and adeno-associated viruses and vaccinia virus. But as said, there are also other non-viral vectors which also play uh, a chunk of role, which are like plasmid and naked DNA. So as said, uh, the landscape has completely changed recently, increasing the trial number to lentiviruses and adeno-associated viruses. So I want to talk about a little bit about the drug development cycle. So the drug development cycle includes like a preclinical phase, a phase one, phase two, and a phase three. And once you reach the phase three, you have an approval process and you go for market. As said, these all phases can also be taught on the lines of a development area. So normally the early stage development is considered to be a preclinical and phase one is considered to be an early development, early, early stage development, whereas phase two and phase three are considered to be a late stage development. Whereas once you have an approval and you go to the market, whatever development happens is related to a commercial development. And putting these perspective on a manufacturing scale, you can say that so the preclinical to phase one still includes the research and development of the biologic. Whereas once you have a phase one uh, product ready and you move into a phase two where you're really looking at uh, phase one done with efficacy and safety studies and phase two is kind of more of action. So where you try to develop these biologics, really bridging the R&D product, transferring to into a uh, clinical good manufacturing, man, uh, clinical good manufacturing practices. So in which you try to develop this product parameters of manufacturing through an engineering process. So these are called engineering runs. And once you have phase three product, it should be actually carried out using under the GMP manufacturing. Once you have an approval and you are a commercial product, you ideally have to carry out through a commercial manufacturing. So this is on looking at 
how manufacturing takes place. And let's now look at like how an analytical method development takes place according to this all role. So as research and development, initially a specific biologic can have its own assay. It has to be defined, it has to be designed, at the same time, it has to be evaluated and optimized. So what it really means is like really understanding uh, a biologic and what should be the critical parameter that should be like defined on this biologic product will be defined and designed. And the parameters of, to optimize this assay will be all done during the research and development process. Once you have an assay with kind of like a variable parameters and that can be like really showing some kind of specificity to your biologic, you move into qualification. The so quali qualification is a process where you take this whole assay, which has been in the research stage, and you really look at like more critical parameters, like the specificity of your uh, product, as well as your linearity, as well as precision and the range of quantification. And this helps to really, most of your phase one, phase two products or quali qualification assay products that are being used uh, most of your assays have been qualified by phase one and phase two. But as you move on to phase three and like the approval process, you have to have the assay validated. So validation is a more robust process in which you ideally take all the parameters that have been performed in qualification, and then you apply and other situations like a robustness as well as the repeatability of the assay in different conditions. So this where you really, the assay is being logged in and really apply it to very specific biological problems. So once the validation is done, you're good to really send it for a PLA, and then you can do it for verification. So looking at what are the different analytical assays in gene therapy for viral vector? So when you look at a viral vector, as I said, uh, recently the landscape has changed for most of the gene clinical trials have moved towards adeno-associated virus and lentiviruses. So I'm going to focus my talk, uh, I'm going to focus more explaining them. So adenosyl virus uh, is a non enveloped virus and it has a genomic part and a protein. So the protein part is a cassette protein, which is made up of like uh, a VP123. And the genomic part is a single standard DNA. And when you come to lentivirus, it's the enveloped virus. The enveloped virus has a capsid inside in which the capsid is like a P24 protein and you have a single standard RNA molecule in the uh, virus. So both these viral vectors uh, have different assays because they have a protein part and as well as the genomic part, which is the nucleic acid part. So given the landscape of different viruses and different assays that are being applied across in gene therapy, looking at the different vector, uh, different uh, assays, you can get an idea like adeno-associated virus has like a titration assay using a qPCR or a distal PCR, uh, where you ideally can ideally do a titration using a HPLC method and uh, an OD method, and also as well as like a transgene expression of like your infectivity. And the same way, uh, Edna associated virus also has a bunch of assays which talk about the specific genomic uh, material that it carries and the protein through analyzer and the potency assays where the transgene is being expressed and really looking at how much infectivity is this virus. And lentivirus also has a bunch of assays on the similar lines, which are like genomic assay, genomic as well as the protein assay. So whatever highlighted in LO are very specific for the genomic assays because today's talk is mostly towards talking about digital PCR. I want to highlight like what are the genomic assays that are applied in gene therapy. So there are different technologies for this nucleic acid amplification tool. So in the field, uh, the field has moved from PCR to microarray, microarray to sequencing, sequencing to nanospring, nanospring, and the digital Doppler PCR. So a quantitative PCR is a regular Tacman Pro PCR where you have a standard and you're ideally you're quantifying your specific nucleic acid from a relative standard curve. In a microarray, you have a, so you use ideally extract your nucleic acid and probe them onto your chip. And once you have 
a complementary probe with the fluorophore is conjugated onto the probe and you read that through a microarray device. And sequencing is ideally you take the genomic DNA, you just amplify based on adapters and really look at like a whole, uh, whole array of like nucleic acids present in the sample. And nanostring has been a new technology in which your specific target DNA is being uh, complemented by uh, two different probes. So one of the probe has a reporter gene that has a complementarity, that is an anchor probe, also has a complementarity to your specific gene. And the barcode is readed on a chip. And the good news with this technology is like you don't really need amplification. You just take your nucleic acid, uh, your extracted nucleic acid, and just put it on the chip, and you're able to read it right away. So, and the recent technology which I'm going to highlight today is the distal doppler PCR. So distal doppler PCR is ideally similar to quantitative PCR, but where the PCR happens in, in, in individual droplets, which are like, uh, the PCR is segregated into partitions and which are uh, individual droplets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like each technology, what are like, what are the different uh, parameters of each technology, and then we can go ahead and discuss about the distal doctor PCR. So pretty much the parameters we consider here are like precision. So precision is kind of like how much accurate uh, can this as technology help us to identify a specific target. So qPCR has a very high, whereas like microarray sequencing has a very low because like these are non-specifically uh, amplification. Uh, whereas nanostring also has a high because you have a very high specific barcode specific. And distal droplet PCR is very high in precision because like it just segregates your PCR and it has very less effect of inhibition or inhibitor. And the number of targets when you look at like uh, qPCR and distal droplet PCR has a low range. So when I mean that, what I mean is like you can only do a maximum on distal PCR is like two amplicons, whereas qPCR you can do like four amplicons. So microarray sequencing are like they just take they consider random amplification, so they are able to amplify uh, a number of like targets. A nanostring also has a high uh, because like you can create a lot of uh, complementarity probes to that. So throughput, uh, when it comes to look at the throughput, throughput is the way how you can really apply a number of samples running at the same time. So quantitative PCR has this high ability because like it can run around like 384 gals at one time. Uh, microarray sequencing and nanostring are pretty low high throughput because the only challenge they have is the multiple steps in the protocol, which makes them like not applicable to high. And digital Doppler PCR is moderate. It still has a bunch of steps to do, but it can be done in a, uh, in a repeatable way. So absolute quantification, when you're really looking at like exact quantification of a genomic titer or uh, putting into consideration, you can really say like uh, digital Doppler PCR has um, like a very high chance of, because it doesn't really depend on any standard curve. Whereas qPCR depends on a standard curve, so the variability is higher. So the cost, uh, qPCR is the lowest and digital PCR has to be moderate and the other three technologies have been very high. So talking about taking all these uh, different parameters and like giving us like more uh, parameters, giving us a idea how digital droplet PCR can play. Uh, I just want to introduce like how the flow can happen for a digital droplet PCR. So digital droplet PCR, uh, the flow workflow happens through is kind of like you have a sample preparation in which the diluted sample is like mixed with uh, the supermix, and you prepare a digital PCR plate. And once the plate is prepared, you seal the plate and mix vigorously to mix your sample with the supermix. And once you start generating droplets, so you use this instrument called the auto droplet generator, in which it has an oil and which feeds the oil through the vacuum into these cartridges where your sample and the oil mix together to form these droplets. So once you have a new plate with all the droplets generated, you take the plate and you seal the plate and run your thermocycler on a PCR. And once your PCR amplification completes, you take the plate and start reading it 
through your QX reader. So the QX reader has like two uh, flow rows, which is called the FAM and HEC. So it's ideally similar to a flow cytometry, and each droplet is red, and it's given you a positive or a negative sign. So the positive normally comes because of your hydrolysis of your probe. And you can, uh, Contosoft software is used to carry out your analysis and report generation. So as said, so each PCR, uh, each sample is divided into 20,000 droplets, and the PCR is carried on in the cycler, and you count the positive and the negative droplet. And ideally, it's an absolute quantification. So the principle involved in digital droplet PCR is poson distribution. So given in ideal situation, so when you feed in like X number of copies, and you ideally expect to see like one target for one droplet, but that's not ideally always the case. In real scenario, some droplets can get like a high number of uh, uh, genomic DNA, whereas the other droplets will not have anything. It's a random process. So to really identify, to really make this correction, the poson, this poson correction has been added to really define this concentration, absolute concentration. So looking at this uh, graph here, so this one clearly shows you a dynamic range, how dynamic, what's the dynamic range of the digital PCR. So what you're looking at here on the x-axis is just a fraction of positive droplets that can be present. So ideally you have a X number of positive droplets divided by the total number of droplets. This is the values you're getting. So on the y-axis, uh, the two y-axis on the left and right, and you see the number of copies for droplet and the number of total drop, total uh, amount of DNA for 20 microliters of the sample. So as you highly increase per droplet, uh, and you have like a target copies per droplet increases when it's like five, and ideally you're reaching a saturation of 10,000 10, copies uh, in this whole reaction. So every droplet will have a nucleic acid and where you don't have a distribution of positive and negative. So ideally in, in scenarios, people have claimed that like your percentage should be around like 0 0.7 or 0, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 to have a good ratio of positive and negative droplets. And as said, this uh, digital droplet PCR has a high dynamic range, which means like it can go even to like a low copy. It can read like around like one copy uh, per reaction. That's what it really claims. So normally you look at like, once you have a draw, digital droplet PCR happen, you get an amplitude plot and you get like a positive and a negative population. So negative population is counted as zero and a positive population is counted as one. So the droplets, uh, at least with one copy, everything is positive and more than one copy is also positive. So as you really increase your, uh, the positive droplets have higher intensity compared to like uh, fluorescence compared to negative. That's where you see this distribution of these two populations. And the software takes into account the positive and the negative population and calculates the boson correction and gives you the copy per microliter. So after looking at all the boson distribution, so the critical factors we should be taking care to really develop this method on a digital doctor PCR is the first thing is really to look at like sample preparation. So sample preparation plays a critical role in digital PCR. So the first things people in literature look, look to really uh, kind of like optimize is the probe and the primer concentration. So the probe concentration people have played around from two, six, 62.5 to 250 nanomolar, and the primer people have played around from 400 to 900. And as said, these concentrations are it's an average, and people have played a little bit lower also. But this is kind of the range where most of the studies have given. And moving on to the sample dilution, sample dilution plays a very important role. So the amount of genomic DNA you feed into the reaction plays a very critical role. So like an absolute quantification, you have to have your positive and a negative population. As you feed like high amount of genomic DNA, uh, it just segregates, uh, it just makes all your droplets positive. So it's ideally, 
important for when you start optimizing this uh, initial method development, you should play around with different concentrations of your genomic DNA. And that way you can calculate back how many copies per microliter you're feeding into the reaction and really find the linear range. And people have also tested like different uh, dilutants, which again, the key buffer or uh, whichever buffer you are eluting your nucleic acid in and what has shown to be a very good negative control and as well as like a dilutant for the sort of PCR and people use them a lot. And the other set of the whole district of PCR, which you need to optimize would be your PCR itself. So the PCR itself, it really depends on ideally your amplicon, target amplicon you're really doing. So the people, uh, once you have defined your target amplicon, you can really go check on the cycling gradient in which you can look at like from 30 to 45 cycles, you can play around with where you get a nice uh, distribution of positive negative, and then look at the amplitude difference, which where you should have a very high amplitude on the positive population. And annealing temperature also uh, plays a very critical role in distal PCR. Uh, the reason whatever you optimize on a quantitative PCR may not always be like transferred into a distal doctor PCR. The reason why is like the ramp speed on the distal PCR is kind of like lower because like these are droplets, each droplet has to be like getting the same temperature. So this ending temperature on your primer probe also has to be like really uh, robustly checked before you optimize your protocol for this PCR. And people try it around like 50 to 75 degrees and that's like a range you can put like do a uh, gradient on your amplicon and really identify the best one. And sonication, the sonication is ideally for like samples which you're feeding like a high amount of genomic DNA, which have a, you have a very low target of sample. So you ideally using sonication to really disrupt the viscosity of your genomic DNA. People tested from three to three seconds of sonication and feed this sample into digital PCR. And people also use like enhancers like the MSO or like Queen and tetra. And these are like kind of like helping to really stop if any inhibitors are like helping uh, for your semi-amplification to become like a completely amplified product and move those whole droplets into like a positive than creating a big brain. So these are kind of like recommendations people have used to, to really establish the initial digital PCR method. And once you have an optimized method and you run your whole digital PCR protocol, and you're going to really receive uh, on your contest of software is like some kind of like uh, a value which is called copies per microliter. So copies per microliter is the amount of like uh, DNA that's present per microliter. And ideally you have like 20,000 droplets and you can ideally calculate back the total concentration according to 20 microliters. And then you get like a total amount of copies in the whole reaction. But the important thing to really consider is like the software actually gives you like two different plots. So one is kind of an amplitude plot and other is like a 1D histogram. So in both these things, there are a few things that we should be really looking at. The first thing in a FAM and WIC is kind of like you should have your positive population and negative population clearly defined uh, in such a way that like they're separated very nicely and you should not have any rain in between. If you have a lot of rain in between, it means like your assay is not optimized to your uh, amplitude. And so the amplitude plot, when you look at like a histogram, it's just like a representation on a histogram where your, ne your negative population and your positive population are completely uh, placed on amplitude, like what's the peak you're really looking at, what's the population height and everything. And there are different factors that people take into consideration when doing a data interpretation. So when you're really doing kind of a genomic hyperassay, it's very important to consider creating kind of your lambda. So lambda is kind of like a log of like, so how do you define like an optimal concentration? It's like defining like exactly you're having a half population of negative and half population of positive. That's where you ideally have to be sure uh, to really get your genomic titer out. 
So that's that's been calculated through uh, the lambda, where the negative population with total number of droplets. So when you have an acceptance of like 0.7, so it, it's been accepted that like you can really take this value and anything above this value, you have like a mostly your population is about nearly around the 50% positive and negative, and you can really get tighter out of it and select more robust. And annealing temperature and primer probe concentration also play a very important role, as I mentioned. So that is can be based on the resolution between the positive and the negative. So that people have calculated using another uh, parameter called separation. So you take the amplitude of the positive minus the amplitude of the negative by amplitude of the negative, and like which will give you like if the separation is ideally more than 1.5, it's considered to be like very uh, high resolution. So which means like you're not reading any kind of like uh, everything, the positive and the negative populations are separated very good. So the ideal temperature gradient has also been shown 52 to 52. People have in literature had a lot of like, it again depends on the target amplicon also at the same time. So the other two factors for the reaction performance people have added to look at is like the peak resolution. So ideally the peak resolution is a factor that's been taken from the chromatography HPLC methods. It's kind of like really considering like the height of the peak and the distance of the peak between the two populations and really looking like if they are separated and if the value is like more than uh, 2.5, it's considered to be like uh, everything red on the positive population is completely positive. So that's where you get a peak resolution. And the percentage of rain is also important as I mentioned previously. So if you have a lot of rain between your positive and negative, it completely uh, increases a lot of variability and what you're reading uh, can be like complete, have a lot of variability in your reading and which means like your assay is not really optimized to your specific sample. So these, again, these are like thought, like uh, very critical to look at, like when you're really designing and really optimizing your digital doctor PCR uh, initial method. And uh, as you have like a more robust method, once you develop, like you can like not really consider, in the initial phases, it's important to consider all these parameters. So stepping like onto the next steps and talking about like assay critical characteristics, like till now we talked about like, how can you develop a method on digital PCR? Now we want to really look at like, what are the critical parameters? As I mentioned, once you have an assay that's been like on a research grade, you want to move into more kind of like a qualification and a PAM uh, validation scale. Uh, on a digital PCR, if you have an essay on a research scale, how do you move them uh, into a qualification? So, so once you want to move an essay into a qualification and validation, so these are like critical parameters that have been mentioned on FDA uh, website, like which you have to really consider like sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, precision, range, you need to understand the range and limit of quantification and robustness and limit of detection. So pretty much like these are like uh, all the important parameters that should be like very precisely defined for an assay to really move that assay into uh, really carry out these qualifications process. So I'm going to talk about like the assay qualification for the distal droplet PCR, what are the recommendations in literature and how should you really look at it. So, when I say essay qualification, most of the essay on a research scale, when has to be like moved into phase one, to apply a qualification. So it should be fit for purpose. First things would be like, okay, uh, digital droplet PCR, you already defined it, so it, it fits the purpose. And then the first critical thing you should be really looking at, like, is the essay really capable of producing repeatable results uh, for the specific purpose? So you have a specific amplicon, you want to really look at this amplicon in a specific set of samples, and is it really producing the same same specific result uh, as this assay is done on different number of samples? And again, this should be performed at least by two analysts to really confirm like, okay, assay is fit for purpose. So 
going on like and talking about like what are the critical parameters that should be considered and what are the acceptance criteria for the digital doctor PCR assay uh, for a qualification. So the first things we can look at is the specificity. So specificity is kind of like really answering the point on the digital doctor on an assay is, okay, we have a specific target and whatever we the assay is designed to really identify the specific target very precisely. That's called specificity. So to really do these experiments, what uh, one of the best experiments to do that is to really look at like taking a non-specific, non-target samples and really checking that like there is no background noise on your specific amplicon happen. So you just want to be so specific that whatever primer probes you design on this digital PCR, you just want to be sure like it's not really uh, amplifying anything on a non-target sample. And you can also take your target sample and make it heat inactivated or nucleus digested and really use the same primer probe and really check out like, okay, if you digest out everything out, are you really able to pick anything? So this really answers like on the digital PCR is like, okay, whatever we design is very specific to the specific uh, target, what we want to really do in the assay. So that's, that's kind of like your specificity, and you can run multiplexing and single, uh, single plexing settings on your digital PCR to really show uh, nothing is uh, kind of like interfering with your target amplicon. And when you go look at the validation, and you really have an assay on a digital PCR, and you want to really do specificity on a validation scale, the first things what people have done is take a blank sample and re really uh, run like your specific amplicon and really see like there's nothing being amplified. And people have also taken blank samples and spiked your specific target into it at the lowest limit of quantification, the lowest limit you identify, you just spike in such amount of and really run multiple times and really show that like this assay is very good. And the second thing we can look at is accuracy. So accuracy is kind of like you have a target and you know like this target has been really uh, your digital PCR really works for this specific target. So you want to, to check for accuracy, what we can do is like you can do a multiple runs of your assay for the same target or do a repetitive sampling and really identify like when you feed in a specific amount of target into your reaction, you're reading out the same concentration. That's called accuracy. So. How do you, people have done using spiked in controls? So take a plasmid, spike into a background, and really check like what's your recovery. And you can, people have also used like specific amplicon integrated cell lines to really look at like your accuracy is really measured on a copy number variation slide. And then, so for a qualification, what we do for the accuracy is like you can run over multiple instruments. So you have a digital PCR in your side, you can go for TRO, run the same uh, accuracy experiment on a different, and look at like how much are you getting? What's the exact value? Are you are you able to get the same exact value? And the accuracy is like always defined to 88 to 120, and the CV should be, once you do an availability, should be less than 20%. So when you go into validation, the validation you ideally take, it takes up to five levels. You really consider the assay or the analyte or the amplicon, you can consider to be like, you consider the lowest limit of quantification, the highest limit of quantification, and you do kind of like other limit of uh, quantification controls. You take like three different quantification controls and really run everything on different instruments and really uh, define for the PCR is accuracy is like, Okay, the specific accuracy for a specific target uh, from six independent runs would be like, your accuracy should be like 120, 80 to 120. And always your CV should be less than 20 to be sure it passes the test. If not, like you have to go back and reanalyze them, redo it. So linearity, so linearity on digital PCR is similar to what you see on QPCR. You ideally take a linearized plasmid, your target amplicon on a plasmid, and you do kind of a serial dilution of it from uh, five-fold dilution or seven-fold dilution, do a linear curve and just run it on digital PCR and identify the range. What's the highest 
uh, you would be ideally uh, confident and the lowest, you're getting like less variability. And people have done spike-ins, like take a plasmid of your target and spike in into a non-specific background and do linearity experiments and really look at like how much, uh, what's the linearity you're able to really recover, do a recovery. And what you ideally identify is like 80 to 120 is acceptable. And you just have, in qualification, you just have to repeat it three times. So range of quantification is kind of like another, uh, to identify the range. So once you define your linearity, so you will get like a upper limit of quantification and a lower limit of quantification of your specific amplicon. So you take the same upper limit of uh, quantification and the lower limit of quantification, and you subdivide that upper limit of quantification into like uh, six different concentrations on the higher range and subdivide them and then run them and really identify like uh, what's the highest and the lowest of your exact uh, the, and the quantification you can really identify your target. So in this way, you're defining very precisely what is the highest upper limit and the lowest lower limit of your uh, specific amplicon that can be in linearity. And uh, so that's called the range of your quantification. So in qualification, uh, it's, it's been tested like three different multiple instruments at the same time is defined as your recovery should be like 80 to 120. So, so th these are kind of like defined for assay qualification on the distal droplet PCR. And moving on, we can talk about like assay validation. So assay validation is a comprehensive experiment as I mentioned previously. So it actually evaluates all the documentation what, which has been done in qualification and take all those qualification parameters and really add few more parameters onto this assay to really check for like inter-assay variability, inter-laboratory assessment, and how much is this assay repeatable and how much robust is this. And in this case, normally on qualification, two analysts done this experiment, two instruments is acceptable. But in validation, it should be done with at least three analysts and three different instruments and very precisely. So on a distal PCR assay, so when you ideally want to have kind of like you have an assay which has been qualified and now you want to really validate it in such a way that the assay can be presented towards like a BLA, that's considered. So primarily people have looked at is the robustness of the assay. So what is actually meant by robustness is like, does this assay can cope up with any small changes that has been applied to the assay? So as said, so we can, so normally a control, uh, spike in control can be used or your specific target uh, in either form, it can be used as a control to do this experiment. So people have done like testing on your distal uh, PCR protocol, like your assay, on different instruments, doing it with different operators. And people have tested like five different primary probe concentrations. What is that range? It is really robust. Like uh, you can, and really show that like it still gives you the same uh, specificity, same value as accuracy. And you can also test like eight different temperatures, like X number and temperatures and really show that like this is the range of like, uh, once you identify an annealing temperature, you go like very minor changes on the uh, annealing temperature and you can define that range of like where this assay is so robust. And on a validation point of view, the recovery should be around like 80 to 120 percent, and this should be like done at least three times. And this important, other important thing is stability. So stability is kind of like uh, in validation, stability plays a critical role because like because stability of the reagent, stability of the reagents, and the assay step, each step in the assay is thoroughly validated, is thoroughly uh, looked at to really answer like how much this assay is stable and how this assay operates between different uh, time, uh, different areas. The first, first things on stability for a digital PCR protocol or like an assay can be really looked at is like the conditions for thaw of an assay reagent. So they should be done at room temperature or they can be done at four degree or you know these these are 
temperature gradients that you can really thaw and really see like how much uh, stable are these reagents at these different thaw conditions. And you can also look at like the pre-thaw stability of reagent. Uh, you pre-thaw it, put it back, and you do kind of like multiple pre-thaws and look at this reagent like how much till how many runs these uh, reagents are more stable in this pre-thaw and the time between droplet generation and PCR cycling, how much time can be left on the plate in such a way that the droplets don't start um, mixing with each other to form big droplets. So this is another critical important part of stability on droplet PCR, where people, uh, when you want to really transfer an assay into like, validation, has to be considered. And the other is the time from once you've done your PCR cycling and transferring the whole plate for droplet reading. And people have tested this at different temperatures. People, when you put at room temperature, uh, they start like colors. Uh, the droplets start mixing with each other from bigger droplets. So uh, putting at four degree, they are more stable. So, but like, again, looking at like, what's the longer temperature on your specific digital PCR uh, assay, how is that applicable for validation? These are, these are things should be looked at. and. Again, as I said, this should be line, done at least three times, pre analyze And as I said, each condition has to be done in three different experiments. So if you're doing like uh, four different parameters you're checking out, and each will have like three different experiments, it's like a collectively like 12 experiments. That's what it really means. So, boom. And the, so once I talk about like all the validation, I would like to talk more about the comparable studies. Because the reason why most of the assays have been really optimized on quantitative PCR, as droplet digital PCR has been a new technology that's coming in. So talking from the point of a vital vector in gene therapy, the primary assays people really use uh, for quantitative PCR is the genomic assays and in which the two different assays people really want to use these uh, QPCR methods is like a viral vector determination or a copy number variation or how much amount of this specific virus is present on a background. So that's kind of like understanding how many, just it can be called a titer also. So as you have an assay that's been developed in quantity PCR in a research grade and you also qualified that assay for phase one, but you ideally have this new technology of droplet digital PCR, and how do you bridge these studies for the previous sample? And how do you apply this droplet digital PCR as you move forward for validation or phase three study? So the best way to do this bridging, bridging studies in literature, people have suggested is like, one thing is like ideally to save samples. Like if you have samples from your you know phase one or the preclinical, save those samples and use the same samples that you ran QPCR, run them on digital PCR, and really identify what's the value you're getting. You know, that that is a very good way of really doing the bridging initial study. And then you can define variability of these methods. Like, okay, both methods are completely different because they use uh, different steps and different polymerases, and you, you have to identify uh, if the variability between your titer is like three to well, two to three four, so it's it's ideally accepted in the, by through FDA said like it it can be accepted. So that's something once it again it changes from amplicon to amplicon. That's a key thing you have to really be defined, uh, be considered. And people have also shown like people already have a qPCR assay and they want to go into digital PCR. They found out like with the standard they took like a specific uh, kind of a standard material and they ran both of them simultaneously and they found like a conversion factor where QPCR adding this conversion factor gets to the same value as the digital PCR. The digital PCR is like an absolute quantification and you have a higher value on the digital PCR. So as I said, uh, the second thing would be running sample side by side on both the assays. Take a sample, run side by side on the both, both the, and really identify uh, what is the critical step that may cause this variability? Because like there are, there are studies where people have talked about like uh, restriction uh, reverse transcriptase on a digital PCR compared to qPCR. Reverse transcriptase plays uh, the timing 60 minutes, qPCR is five minutes, 
and you have this huge uh, tighter variation when you increase to 60 on a qPCR, you exactly get the same value. So people have shown these kind of studies. So it's kind of like taking your sample, run them side by side, and really identify like what is that uh, critical step that can cause variability between these two assays. So these, these are kind of bridging assays. But as I said, there are also challenges, right? Like, so what are the challenges would be like, you may not have enough sample, like, okay, you have run these samples, qPCR and phase one, but you may not have, once you want to transfer into digital PCR. So ideally, you, the best way is to really use some kind of like, uh, a standard material that you use in both the assays and really identify them. So, so critical process parameters may not be known. So what it really means is like, uh, if you really consider like accuracy or like um, precision or range of quantification, these are things may not be defined for your specific design amplicon, which will be really important to consider, uh, which may be defined on a qPCR, but it may be be required to define on your digital droplet PCR. So, and we know like qPCR has this ability to get like inhibitors can play a big role because it's a bulk reaction. So whereas digital droplet PCR has shown like more uh, robustness towards like impurities and inhibitory factors. So this is something to consider when you're really moving from qPCR to why the titer is like higher uh, in uh, absolute PCR and uh, digital PCR. If these, are, these are things to identify what are the impurities that can play a role. You know? And again, okay, this, the important thing would be limited assay development. Like you may not have a specific good reference for your amplicon. Uh, that is something you might have to really go and establish, you know? Uh, that might limit your understanding or your bridging study between quantitative PCR and digital droplet PCR. But again, these are thoughts like, you know, taking in from literature and giving, putting there like mm, thoughts, like how can you really define and answer the important so the final thought would be like, you know, digital droplet PCR is kind of like, and uh, it has like a, uh, it's an absolute quantification. So it really doesn't depend on a standard curve to give a value. And it can also have this ability if you have a low, uh, the sensitivity is on the lower level is much higher. So it can really go uh, very low as like people on literature claim to one copy. So that's to be considered. And so it's, it's another thing is like, as I mentioned, it's tolerant to PCR inhibitors because like it's kind of like individual reaction and droplet. And that, that's something is also very critical. So any small change in expression because it's not a bulk reaction, it's in a droplet. So that change can be like identified immediately. Even a semi-amplification will give you a positive uh, droplet consider whereas like in a QPCR, it's a bulk, it, it may not be like uh, completely like pick, picked up in this bulk react. So that, that's another important. So as I said, so these are some of the references uh, to go ahead and really look at. And uh, this, this view a very good uh, overview of like QPCR, digital PCR. And again, these are like more related to um, gene therapy and virology, but uh, this can be a good starting point. And I would like to um, acknowledge by uh, Texas a &M University giving the opportunity to do my graduate degree and Lonza and Sana for me, providing me my scientist in training right now. So, and I would like I would like to thank uh, Lab Rats Lab Roots for providing me this good opportunity to provide this talk. And thank you. <laughs>